they had major devastating events. These were the type that crushed their civilization. Not wars, not pestilence, but dramatic physical events that literally crushed their civilization into back into the cave ages. And we see the devastation in cities in South America, ancient cities, that are now being discovered, which were obviously destroyed by massive earthquake type situations. Earth definitely, without question, has had major earth changes that have destroyed entire civilizations, and the indication is that it was not that long ago. The concept of a pole shift, in other words, the earth moving its either magnetic or physical pole, has come up uh, many times when uh, we hear people talking about Planet X. Uh, mountain ranges would form, oceans would form huge tides, and uh, this would not be uh, something you'd want to uh, face in everyday life. This is, it would be a very violent event. There's, there's evidence that in the past, uh, such as the Ice Age and uh, mastodons being frozen instantly with still undigested food in their stomach, all over the earth, there is uh, evidence that in the past we have had polar shifts or some type of cataclysmic event on earth which happens in cycles over time. If this is in fact true, there would have to be evidence of these passages, ecological evidence, archaeological evidence that shows the uh, calamitous events that transpired during each passage. Our earth gives evidence that we have had periodic pole shifts. Um, there is mountain building in and of itself is evidence. These mountains are like pushed together. If you're in an airplane and you look down at foothills, for instance, it almost looks like a rumpled blanket, like somebody took a blanket and pushed it and rumpled it. Mountains are, are forced upwards with great masses of rock snapping. Uh, this is signs of, of great pressure, not the gentle squeezing and pushing that happens with earthquakes at all. Indeed, uh, the, our Earth has had these periodic uh, pole shifts. You can see that in the evidence of the Earth. Uh, go back every peri time period and you can see other changes during these passages. And when we have pole shifts and violent geological earthquakes and changes and the like, shifting the, of the tipping of the Earth and shifting of the crust, uh, volcanoes explode. Um, and when they do, there's a lot of l molten lava pouring out. Well, lava will, being molten, will line up with a current magnetic field. And when lava hardens, that's a permanent freeze, indicating the direction of magnetism at that moment in time. Well, this is one way that they have determined uh, the wandering pole theory, where they've identified places in Earth where they say, uh, at, at one time, this appears to have been the North Pole, or that appeared to have been the South Pole, is through this frozen lava um, alignment. For instance, off of Japan, there's cities and roads that they find under the water. In Bermuda, we see roads and walls and the like. Uh, likewise, land can rise. Uh, Atlantis is rumored to be a continent that went under the waves during one of these cataclysmic uh, passages. Back around 1650 BC, or if you want to be, give it a little more leeway, between 1500 and 1700 BC, there is considerable evidence for a calamitous event. In fact, there are stories from that time uh, showing certain civilizations came and went, certain uh, powers that be were uh, overthrown at the time because of the celestial events that were happening and the earth changes that were happening. The last passage was during the Jewish Exodus, approximately 3,600 years ago. Nobody knows for sure the exact date because during these passages uh, mankind is just discombobulated. They stop keeping records, records are lost, so nobody can exactly pinpoint the date. There is a pattern to the cataclysms on Earth. If we go back every 3600 year period we see that some major world catastrophe happens. There are other changes happening in the solar system. One such theory says that cow flatulence, believe it or not, is responsible for depleting our ozone layer, which leads to our polar caps melting. But what about Mars? What about Mars's polar caps? They seem to be melting as well. There are many changes happening in the solar system. So what would be influencing our entire solar system as a whole, not just Earth? Observations are being made, and with little notice to the public. 
This article from CNN tells of a potential killer comet detected with only weeks of warning. In recent times, new planets and outer solar bodies are being discovered and observed. With so much sky to observe, it's no wonder we have so many last-minute reports of potential near misses. Or could there be more that is being downplayed in the media or withheld altogether? There are a lot of probes that we send to Mars or to the outer planets to do imaging, um, which could also have black ops projects attached to them that the public isn't going to know about. So if we send an orbiter to Mars to uh, you know, do a main mapping mission, it might have other black ops projects attached to that satellite collecting its own data that we're just not going to know about. And if they need to take into a full account uh, the main mapping mission or you know, take over that project for their own purposes, that satellite is gone. It becomes a black project. And people aren't, people aren't aware of those facts. The observatories around the world, many of them are very aware, acutely aware, and very worried about this inbound planet. Uh, you really need to look at what's happening, the weather irregularities, the changes in the Earth, and think of it in terms of these periodic passages uh, and make up your own mind. We don't have to have a collision for something to affect us, it can affect us at a distance. It could be on the other side of the sun, have a very large discharge into the sun. The sun could erupt with a full coronal discharge, which means it would come off in all directions from the sun, and we would be very affected. Our weather would be very affected, and this new object, planet X or whatever you would call it, would be very far away from Earth. So the thing I want to stress is that you do not need a direct collision with something to be affected. The government agencies, uh, they are basically under contract not to tell you anything. They, the scientists have signed non-disclosure agreements, basically uh, they're under a gag order. It is impossible to go to a scientist and get a news release directly. You have to go through an official news release agency and...
Okay, guys, you're not going to believe this footage I got here. Check this out. This is Comet Elenine right here. You see that? Okay, now the sun is on this side. This is where the sun is. There's an explosion that takes place. Jupiter is over here. This is Comet Elenine. Now watch this. I'm going to play it again. It's coming from right here. You see it, you see it skipping across. And as it gets hit by this pulse, it turns to the left and breaks apart. Look at this. Here we go again. It, it's coming along here. Skipping along. This is Elanine. As that pulse hits it, you can see the pulse coming out. It looks like a huge explosion comes off of Jupiter. This could be validating that video that I put out or that I replayed from my show the other day where they said that it would be like a capacitor. As this comet gets close to any other bodies, it shoots out a capa like a, a, an electro kind of an electrostatic kind of thing. It blows up the, uh, the comet. They said that this possibly could happen again, as it did in 2000 with that other comet, that as it crossed the ecliptic, it hit like a brick wall and blew up. Well, here we go. We got some footage of this. This, comes, this explosion comes out of Jupiter. The sun is on the other side. Here we go. Look at I'm going to show it to you again. It, it's almost like this pulse just comes out and just whacks it with this massive explosion. This is Comet Elenine right here. You see how it turns? Watch this. It's right here. It's coming along. And as soon as this thing hits it, it turns and it just disintegrates. Look at this. See it right there? Boom. Here we go again. See how it just turns and just explodes. It's coming along, boom. So you're just seeing it really quick now, boom. Boom. Just fast motion it, boom. See how it just turns and just explodes. But look at this pulse here. It, this looks like a massive e ejection or some kind of a, a pulse that just hits it and it breaks it apart. Now I'm sure we're gonna have more footage uh, tomorrow but this is breaking footage right here guys make this viral pass this about I guess we don't have to worry about Comet Elenine it looks like it has been taken off of its course at least I'm sure it's gonna be breaking up but what the heck is this explosion here this is Jupiter see you can see the little Jupiter JU uh, this is Jupiter and this took place today We believe, though we cannot yet prove, that our multiverse universe is 11-dimensional. Now, wormholes are predicted by mathematical calculations. It certainly seems to be theoretically possible. Universe in different dimensions, floating in a much larger arena. And this larger arena is the, uh, the hyperspace that I talked about originally. Entrada a la ciudad de la Inca de Pacific. If you look at the tree, you know, it's right here. I mean, it's 300 foot up. It's very intense, bright lights. I keep hearing that over and over and over. And they cut, they spanned a wide area. Just when you thought there could not be more change going on in the world, Magnetic North is moving. Aviators know it has always moved, but not like this. It's just skipping along. It's on the move about 40 miles a year now along the polar cap toward Russia. Well, hey, get used to it. Einstein was wrong. Well, a major announcement today by NASA that a new form of life has been discovered right here on Earth. Where they come from, I don't know. But it's one thing I know for sure. They They've landed on Earth and they come among us. They keep us homeless. We can't get a job. Before too long, the evidence will be incontroversial that uh, you will have on your TV screens and on your movie screens concrete evidence. We are infected with a lot of them around here, and especially here, around here, and everywhere we look at. And that they are real, and they're not fantastic things which have been cooked up to make a movie. The isolation from other people in population, and then they don't go up. I don't feel like I belong here. The unrest is being caused by thugs. They're hired by the system to turn the public against the immigrants. I say fuck the money. Does the job market dry up as a result of this? Many a job. They're taking teenage jobs, travel jobs, anything. 
better be ready to protect right, yourself. Because it's one thing I don't understand what they want. You're gonna see awesome change. They, 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 they know the gig is up. You're encouraging a violent confrontation from people that have done nothing wrong. The police and any authority, they make you feel like aliens. Not good, it's not good at all. One of my friends just disappeared. I think he was abducted. Pretty soon, there ain't gonna be any human. Like, like creatures crawling around in They try to make it seem like it's just a horror movie, but it's really not a horror movie. It's really an actual thing, and they use that as a cover-up. From LA, from, from Hollywood to come. How long they been here, what they been doing, unexplainable. I think the government ain't doing nothing to, to prevent this, and I also believe that they're covering it up with medication. You never ask a system to teach your values, because the values of the system is all cover -up. I'm telling you, the system has everyone in their pocket. They look like us, and they are among us. But all I know, you could be one. Then they're gonna try to cover it up, and then they're gonna try to bring it out. Videotaping us, letting your society know this is what's going on on Earth. They're watching us. And uh, at first, I wasn't sure because it was so grainy, just watching it, you know, through a couple of levels there. So, but I matched it up in dates, and this is what it looked like before it was washed. Now, the entire world was looking to the right on this exact time. You see the tail of ice sun going in here in the large picture, inky under it. Okay, the whole focus of the entire world was the opposite direction. Well, I checked this thing out, and again, I was recording it on the other cameras on that day. Most people were. And before they got back to the Sechi HI-1A camera, I went back and I got about four clips. This thing came in from the left. I was checking it on this gray camera because it will eliminate almost any lens flare that you're dealing with. Okay? But why were they scrubbing on the left side, guys? This object, don't know how big it is, came in from the left. They knew the timing it was coming in. They knew to get everyone's attention towards the sun. Coming Ison was coming in, coming in perfect opportunity. We're still watching it. I'm still watching it. These are all enhanced images that I did. Guys, and when the solar flare came across this thing, the shadow of it even changed. Look at this. See how the flare came across Ison's tail? You see that? And then the object completely changed. The top darkened just like the top of the image. And the light from the solar flare lit up the bottom of it. Now I sent the, I analyzed it, sent it back in, and Paul was looking at it today on the show. We were talking about it, called in just for a moment. Here's Ison coming into the top right, guys. This is the, a day later. So we a perihelion had already came around. Kind of, it's the same camera though. Just to show you, it's not you're not seeing it there. It came through on this camera on that date. Now, we were talking about it on the show. And a fellow called in. He couldn't tell us about himself. He said his name was Mike, worked for the federal government. He said the picture was real, that someone had let it leak out. Four people had just lost their job about it. But I'm sure Paul will probably archive that video tonight. I'm not sure his schedule on how he does that, guys. Some of you know more about that than I do. But he may have the guy that called in. It's not me. I mean, there was... There was uh, several hundred people on the radio show at that time that heard him call and say the images are real. And, guys, I couldn't get them to blend out or, bl or to create any type of anything that looked like a lens flare. Now, a couple of things here. you got a small asteroid out to the top left as we're looking at Ison coming in. Now, some of the, I want you to notice something about Ison here is that I'm going to bring it up and I'm going to do a steel shot, but it almost appears to be turning. In other words, it, it looks like a fan from the side. It's actually a cone, like looking at the bottom of it, and there's a shadow on the left side, and it appears to be turning somewhat. That could be natural because of the way the camera's turning, and Ison is actually should be going in a straight line now. Now, this is Lovejoy. I was looking over on this camera to see what uh, if Ison had appeared on it yet, and it has not. But 
that's Comet Lovejoy. It rises up, and you see it gets a little brighter in the last few images from a, so, a solar flare. Do you see that? Well, I'm going to bring this up. But Lovejoy is still kicking. Now, it's not a sun diver, but this is the area that I sun will be coming through. You see Mercury in that cl the star cluster there is the Pleiades. Now, this, I think, is just a... Uh, I think it's something on the lens, guys. I'm not sure. It looks like a Mississippi buzzard. I know someone's going to say Klingon, bird of prey. It's moving right there. I don't know. But uh, I, th that's love joy there. And this is the area we're going to be watching for that fan pattern of ice on if we can pick it up on this camera. Now, check this out. This is the one I had saved that I went back. Did you see what happened on the left? Now, you see the tails of Inky and ice on going into the sun. You're going to see a couple flashes to the left. That look at that solar activity that those comets cr are creating, guys. There's our image. It's not a sun flare. I mean, a lens flare, guys. D but wait, I forgot. You're not supposed to look that way, remember? Don't look back. All eyes to the right. Stay in step. Here's after the flare comes under. Lights up the bottom of the object. Here, they've scrubbed it. There's still a faint circle in the time. Now, it, we don't know anything about a size because we don't have anything to compare it to. How close was it to the stereo A camera, right? But we do know that it was taken off. Why? We got a caller that sounded official. Sounded like he knew what he was talking about. Four people lost their job over that image getting leaked to the public. Is there something out there that will make a man's heart fail out of fear guys what's going on with this don't know it's a heads up be safe no yeah i'm sure it was the good like but that to the that's what i would In the beginning, Nibiru was a lush planet, teeming with life and vegetation. Nibiru orbits the sun once every 3,600 years. This is called one shar. Volcanic eruptions on Nibiru enveloped the planet with a thick protective atmosphere, keeping the heat trapped on the planet during its long, cold outer orbit and shielding it from the sun's heat during its inner close orbit. Unlike the other planets, its rotation was elongated while the other planets and the hammered bracelet we call the asteroid belt were more circular in their solar orbits. As time went on and the people of Nibiru advanced, great astronomers and scientists emerged, even savants of great wisdom. Each shar or orbit, the conditions on Nibiru grew worse, drought and Crop loss were studied, and it was determined that the orbit was growing closer to the sun on the inner courses. Their atmosphere was growing thinner because of declining volcanic emissions. During the Sixth Kingdom, Inshar was born. He was born wise and studied and mastered much learning. He decided to study the other planets in their atmospheres to try to find a solution to his own planet's thinning shield. As Nibiru approached the first five planets on the inbound orbit, in named them. An and Antu, he called the first two twin planets. The next two were the largest, and he named them Anshar and Kishar. One planet had a more elongated orbit, and on some inner approaches, it was the first one to greet them. He named it Gaga. After these first five planets, they approached the asteroid belt of Brown boundary called the hammered bracelet it was the guardian of the inner four planets or the forbidden zone and protected them from intrusion Inshar decided to study the atmosphere of the greeters the first five planets 
On each orbit, the Nibirians launched spaceships to study each planet in hopes of finding a solution to their own planet's problem. They discovered much and were astounded but confused on how to apply this new knowledge. Each orbit or shar, Nibiru became drier as the hole in their atmosphere grew wider. The councils of the planet tried to launch shields, but they fell back to the planet. They considered how to manipulate the volcanoes back to increased activity. Alula, the king of Nibiru, for nine shars, 32,400 years, was defeated by Anu, his cupbearer, in hand-to-hand combat. After this, Alulu escaped Nibiru in a nuclear-powered spacecraft. Alulu had pre-planned a trip through the Forbidden Zone to Earth to search for gold to use as a white powder to chemtrail into the atmosphere to rebuild it. The crossing was forbidden and had never been attempted. This was Alula's plan to save Nibiru and become king again. As he flew through the heavens, he looked back at the great Nibiru and its belching fire, its life-sustaining envelope. Its hue of redness was like a sea churning. From space, he could see the enormous breach in its planet's shield. He watched as his planet grew smaller and smaller. To snow-hued Earth, Alula set his course. By secret, from the beginning, he chose his destination. The next time Alula looked back to Nibiru, it was too small to see. Fear and remorse gripped his heart. He considered turning back, but journeyed on through the darkness of the outer solar system. A hundred leagues, a thousand leagues, the chariot was coursing. Ten thousand leagues, the chariot was journeying. In the wide heavens, darkness was the darkest. In the far away, distant stars, their eyes were blinking. More leagues, Alula traveled. Then a sight of great joy met his gaze. In the expanse of the heavens, the celestial emissary greeted him. Little Gaga, the one who shows the way. By its circuit, Alulu was greeting to him a welcome extending. Alulu speeded through the solar system and described the beauty of each planet. Finally, beyond the fifth planet, he reached the asteroid belt, the hammered bracelet. Ahead was raining. To, to demolish, it was a waiting. Of rocks and boulders was it together hammered. Like orphans with no mother, they banded together. Many times the Nibirian ships had been destroyed trying to cross through this bracelet. Alulu stirred up the fire stones in his spaceship and increased power. Alulu fired death missiles at the great rocks one by one as he entered the belt. The hole in the asteroid belt opened and Alulu spotted the seventh planet and the sun. He set his machine for the snow-hued Earth. He noticed the Earth was smaller the Nibiru and the gravitational force was weaker. The planet was divided into three parts, the top and bottom white and the middle blue and brown. Deftly, Alulu spread the chariots of resting wings around the Earth's ball to circle. In the middle region, dry lands and watery oceans he could discern. The beam that penetrates downward he directed. Earth's innards to detect. I have attained it, he ecstatically shouted. Gold, much gold, the beam has indicated. It was beneath the dark-hued region and the waters it was too. With pounding heart, Lula, a decision was contemplating. Shall he on the dry land his chariot bring down, perchance to crash and die? Shall he to the waters his course direct, to perchance it into oblivion sink? Which way shall he survive? Will it be the treasured gold discovered? In the eagle's seat, Lulu is not stirring. To fate's hands, the chariot he entrusted. Fully caught in earth's attracting net, the chariot was moving faster. Its spread wings became aglow. Earth's atmosphere like an oven it was. Then the chariot shook, emitting a mortifying thunder. With abruptness, the chariot crashed, with a suddenness altogether stopping. Senseless from the shaking, stunned by the crash, Alula was without moving. Then he opened his eyes and knew he was among the living. At the planet of gold, he victoriously arrived. 
His chariot on dry land ascended. At the edge of extended marshes it landed. He put on an e It was a white-hued ball in the heavens, and it was quickly rising. Kingu, the earth's companion, he now beheld. What in the accounts of the beginning his eyes the truth could now see. The planets in their circuits, the hammered bracelet he had all seen. Kai the earth, Kingu its moon, all created were, all by names were called. In his heart, Alula knew one more, truth of beholding was needed. The goal, the means of salvation to be found was needed. If the truth from the beginning tells were true, as by the waters of the golden veins of Tiamat were washed. If the waters of Kai, its cut off half, gold must be found. With hands unsteady, Alula the tester from the chariot's pole dismantled. With trembling hands, the fish suit he donned, the fast arriving daylight eagerly awaiting. At daybreak, the chariot he exited to the marshes he quickly stepped. In the deeper waters he waded, the tester into the waters he inserted. Its illuminated face he eagerly watched. In his chest, his heart was pounding. The water's contents was the tester indicating by symbols and numbers its findings disclosing. Then Alulu's heartbeat stopped. There's gold in the waters, the tester was telling. Unsteady on his legs, Alulu stepped forward. Deeper into the marshes, he made his way. Again in the tester into the waters, he inserted. Again the tester, gold announced. A cry, a cry of triumph from Alulu's throat emanated. The Biru's fate in his hands now was. Back to the chariot, he made his way. The fish's suit off he took, the commander's seat he occupied. The tablet of destinies that knows all circuits he enlivened to Nibiru circuits to find the direction. The speaker of words he stirred up toward Nibiru the words to carry. Then the Nibiru words he uttered, thus he was saying, The words of the great Alulu to Anu on Nibiru are directed. On another world I am, the gold of salvation I have found, the fate of the Nibiru is in my hands. To my conditions, you must give heed. Greatly was disappointed. He turned away from the marshes in the directions of the hills he went. He made his way through vegetation, bushes, to trees gave way. The place was like an orchard. The trees with fruit were laden. By their sweet smell enticed, the Lulu picked a fruit in his mouth. He put it. Sweet with the smell, sweeter the taste was. Alulu greatly was delighted. Away from the sun's rays, Alulu was walking toward the hills. He set his direction. Among the trees, a witness under his feet, he sensed a sign of close-by waters. In the direction of the witness, he set his course. In the midst of the forest, there was a pond, a pool of silent waters. Into the pond, the sampler he lowered. For drinking, the water was good. The Lulu laughed, an unstopping laughter seized him. The air was good, the water for drinking was fit, there was fruit, there were fishes. With eagerness, Lulu bent down, together his hands he cupped, water to his mouth he brought. A coolness did the water have, a, a taste from Nibiru's water, it was different. Once more he drank, then with fright he asunder jumped. A hissing sound he could hear. A slithering body by the poolside was moving. He carried weapon he seized, a blast of its ray toward the hissing he directed. The moving stopped. The hissing was ended. To examine the danger, Alula stepped forward. The slithered body lay still, dead with a creature, a sight most strange. Like a rope, its long body was without hands or feet was the body. Fierce eyes were on its small head, out of its mouth a long tongue. A sight on Nibiru never beheld it was a creature of another world. Was it the orchard's guardian? Alulu by himself pondered, was it the water's master? Himself he asked. In his carried flask he some water collected. With alertness to the chariot he made his way. The sweet fruits he also picked to the chariot to set his course. The brightness of the sun's rays were greatly diminished. Darkness it was at the chariot he reached. The shortness of the day, Alulu pondered its shortness. 
him amazed. From the direction of the marshes, a cool lightness on the horizon was rising. A white-hued ball in the heavens was quickly rising. King Boo, the earth's companion, he now beheld. What in the accounts of the beginning his eyes the truth could now see? The planets and their circuits, the hammered bracelet, Kai, the earth, King Boo, its moon, all created were and all by names were called. In his heart, Alula knew one more truth of beholding was needed. The goal, the means of salvation to be found was needed. If truth be in the beginning tales, if by the waters of the golden veins of Tiamat were washed, if the waters of Kai, its cut off half, gold must be found. With hands unsteady, Alula the tester from the chariot's pole dismantled. With trembling hands, the fish's suit he donned, the first arriving daylight eagerly awaiting. At daybreak, the chariot he exited to the marshes he quickly stepped. Into deeper waters he waded, the tester into the waters he inserted. Its illuminated face he eagerly watched. In his chest his heart was pounding. The water's contents was the tester indicating by symbols and numbers its findings disclosing. Then Lulu's heartbeat stopped. There's gold in the waters, the tester was telling. Unsteady on his legs, Lulu stepped forward deeper into the marshes. He made his way. Again, he the tester into the waters inserted. Again, the tester gold announced. A cry of triumph from Lulu's throat emanated. Back to the chariot, he made his way. The fish's suit he off he took, the commander's seat he occupied. Tablets of destinies that know all circuits he enlivened to Nibiru's circuit to find the direction. The speaker of words he stirred up towards Nibiru the words to carry. Then to Nibiru words he uttered that thus he was saying, The words of the great Alulu to Anu on Nibiru are direct. On another world I am, the gold of salvation I have found. The fate of Nibiru is in my hands. To my conditions, you must give heed. December 8, 2012. We've been going over the Nibiru Chronicles. I want to go to a section in the middle. I think it's important now. It's about the Great Flood and their records of it. And just to give you a little background about this, for thousands of years, the Anunnaki had ruled the earth. The Romans, the Greeks, all of their gods came from there. All of the gods across the Mayan civilization all of that came from these astronauts. And I believe before I am through with this series, I can point out enough evidence worldwide to show you. And you can go in and find copies of these Sumerian texts. I'll put a link to one of them. You read them for yourself. These are old, old tablets, the oldest known to man. They haven't been touched. They've been dated. They explain too many things to have been imagined. You can't imagine laser weapons. You can't imagine spaceships. Unless you're in our time and day, you've seen movies, you've read books. All of that, all of the movies you've seen, all of the big Star Trek 2012 came from these writings. The book Dune came from these writings, but these writings are not imagined. This happened. Now, what they knew that Nibiru was approaching Earth. And we'll be able to lead up to the story before I start reading. Now, in the Bible, Noah was told to take two of all creatures. Now, in, that, in the town here, we've got not Noah, but Zarasudra was his name, and he was an Anunnaki. He was from, he was the son 
of Inki. He was a great navigator called Master of the Waters. They chose him for this boat. Now, the reason the flood was coming was on one of the orbits that Nibiru comes into our inner solar system. It was too close. For thousands of years, its own planet had been declining because of this and other things. Well, when they, they were radioed from Nibiru that it was approaching fast. <clears throat> so what they did was they set up observation points and observatories on the South Pole because that's where it was coming from. Does that sound familiar? Every nation on Earth now has an observatory on the South Pole, guys. Why are they doing that? But they set that up there to watch. They also set up people to watch for earthquakes. They sent people to the North Pole to give alarms when this time come. But there were two brothers involved, Enlil and Inca. Now, Enlil did not want Inca to teach the humanoids that had been raised and their DNA changed to be slaves. They, they did not want them to know anything except that they were gods. And that way they would bow down and be slaves. Now, Inkai had a kinder heart. Both were Anunnaki princes. But he had, he had saw the human race evolve. He'd grown fond. His children had married into the human race. But when this time came, they had a, only a certain amount of spacecraft available. All of the Anunnaki could not leave. And the older ones, Enlil, Inkai, their sister, they never, none of them could leave. They had been on Earth too long. With the 3,600-year cycle of one year around the sun with Nibiru, they aged far too quickly if they went back. And they noticed also that while they were on Earth, that their years had sped up. One account was a spacecraft came. They were coming back and forth transporting gold. They had mined Africa. N.K. and some of his group noticed that people that were older than them when they had left Nibiru appeared younger now. That's because they were aging faster on Earth. But anyway, they knew they only had a certain amount of ships to get back to Nibiru. Other ones couldn't even go back, so they had to launch into ships, into ships above the Earth and watch the deluge. Now, Zero Sudra... We know him as Noah, was told to take in just this area the folks there. His He had pure pedi pedigree. His wife, their sons did. But the main thing about this boat was that Nemo, Enlil and Inky's sister, she was the science expert. She was a doctor. When she knew this was coming against Enlil's wishes, he wanted to human race annihilated. He didn't want them to grow any further. The earth was going to be covered. He'd rather start over. Well, she and her nurses went across the earth in the months leading up to this and gathered the DNA of all the animals, of all the races. They gave them to Zara Sudra to go in this boat with the people. Now, I'm going to read from there. It says, eager to see Zara Sudra depart. The townspeople to the boat brought food and water. Now, they didn't know what was going on. He had been told to lie. He had been told he was going to build this boat, sail across the ocean because the gods were angry with him. So if he left, peace would come back and prosperity to this area of the country there. And so they all helped him. They wanted the things were going bad. They wanted it to get better. So they helped him build the boat. They helped him put provisions in it. Some of them even went with him. Now, it says, from their own mouth, sustenance they took. To appease Enlil, they were in a hurry. Four-legged animals into the boat were also driven. Birds from the field by themselves just flew in. And to the boat, Zara Sidra, his spouse and sons, embarked. Their wives and children also came. Any who to the abode of the Lord Inkai wished to go, let them to aboard come. In other words, he didn't shut the doors. Just a lot of them didn't want to leave. They thought, well, if it's going to get better, let's just hang here. It said, So to Zara Sudra, to the gathered people announced, envisioning Enlil's abundance, only some of the craftsmen the call heeded. They didn't want to go. 
on the sixth day, Ninengal, Lord of the Great Waters, to the boat came. He was going to be the navigator. A son of Inkai, he was to be the boat's navigator. He was selected. A box of cedar wood in his hands he held. Listen, guys. By his side in the boat he kept it. The life essences and life eggs of living creatures it contains by the Lord Inkai and Ninma collected. Remember, Inkai cared for the humans, and his sister Ninma did too. It was their brother Enlil that wanted them destroyed. From the wrath of Enlil to be hidden, to life resurrect, if earth be willing. So did Ninengal to Zarasudra explain. Thus were all be beasts brought by their twos into the boat. Now Ninengal and Zarasudra in the boat, the arrival of the seventh day awaited. In, 100 and the, in the 120th shar was the deluge awaited. Now remember, a shar is one orbit of 3,600 years. These guys were very old, just like in the Bible. In the tenth shar of the life of Zarasudra was the deluge forming. He had ten cycles, 3,600 years, guys. In the station of the constellation of the line was the avalanche looming. Now this is the account of the deluge that over the earth swept, and the Anunnaki escaped. They left in their ships, and now Zarasudra and the boat survived. Four days before the days of the deluge, the earth was rum rumbling, groan as it with pain it did. For nights before the calamity struck, and the heavens Nibiru as a glowing star was seen. Listen to this, guys. Four nights before the calamity struck, and the heavens Nibiru as a glowing star was seen. They, if you hadn't had that South Pole Observatory set up, they wouldn't have known it. They would have not had time. Then there was darkness in daytime, and at night the moon as though by a monster swallowed. The earth began to shake by a net force before unknown it was ag agitated. In, in the glow of dawn, a black cloud arose from the horizon. The morning's light to darkness changed as though by death's shadow veiled. Then the sound of a rolling thunder boom lighting the skies with lightning. Guys, the thunders were, t were sealed up in John in Revelation. You think this may be why? said, Depart, depart. You two to the Anunnaki gave the signal. Crouched in the boats of heaven, the Anunnaki heavenward were lofted. Now, they were waiting in the spacecraft. They weren't down in the boat. It says, In Shuraback, 18 leagues away, the bright eruptions by Ninegal was seen. Button up, button up the hatch, Ninegal to Zero Sudra said. Together the trap door that the hatch concealed, they pulled down. Watertight, enclosed completely was the boat. Inside, right, a ray of light penetrated. On that day, on that unforgettable day, the deluge with a roar began. In the white land at the earth's bottom, the earth's foundations were shaking. The white land, guys, the South Pole, that's where they were watching it. It said, then with a roar to a thousand thunders equaled. Off its foundations, the ice sheet slipped. By Nibiru's unseen net force, it was pulled away into the South Sea, crashing. One sheet of ice into another ice sheet was smashing. Remember, it's coming up from the poles. The whitened surface like a broken eggshell was crumbling. Guys, you think somebody made this up? All at once a tidal wave arose. The very skies was a wall of water reaching. A storm, its ferocity never before seen as the earth's bottom began to howl. Its, its winds, the wall of water was driving. The tidal wave northward was speedy, spreading. Northward was the wall of water on rushing, the Abzu lands it was reaching. There from toward the settled lands it traveled, then Eden it overwhelmed. When the tidal wave, the wall of water sure back reached, the boats of Zero Sidra, the tidal wave from its moorings lifted, tossed it about like a watery abyss, the boat is swallowed. Though completely submerged, the boat held firm, not a drop of water into it entered. Outside the storm's wave, the people overtook like a killing battle. I'll finish this, guys. Heads up. Hi, everyone. I look for a lot of the different secrets and mysteries from all around the world, looking for the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, the Son of God, who was raised from the dead and took all the sins of the world away. 
Now the world elite, the Illuminati, the Freemasons, and even the spiritual realms all around us, they leave their signs and secrets and symbolism. And on my channel we bring all this stuff back to the Word of God and find the truth. Now there is a lot of talk of Nabooru, the Destroyer, or Planet X, for the end of days from a lot of different religions. It is even in the Bible, here in the Exodus, they talk of the Destroyer when it comes. Just as when the seven plagues took down Egypt and killed the firstborn, and the Lord Jesus called, caused the Destroyer to pass over Moses. Well, there's another book called the Colbrin. This is not the Bible, and if you read this book, have the Word of God inside of you perfectly, and don't let this book twist you around in any way. In my research over the many years, I have read all of these things from many different books from all around the world, and seen what all the signs and clues and things that all of the Freemasons and Illuminati are leaving all around us. Our channel is as a team of, ge of detectives working for the Lord Jesus. We are firmly grounded in the Word of God from page one to the last page. We all know the Word of God perfectly and this is our foundation. We do not stray from this. But here in this Colburn text, this is what the Freemasons and such and the Illuminati and the world elite, this is one of their things that they are going by. Not all of it, but they are going by the destroyer that is in here. And this will show why the great deception is coming upon the earth, is what I'm trying to show. Is that even right here in the Denver airport murals, they show here the destroyer coming, the winged disc, after the time of the red, the time of Esau rising, after the great tribulation. They even show a rapture, and then the guillotines, and then the, the destroyer coming. This is the oil for the foolish virgins, and then the earth is renewed. This is talked of several times in this book here of the Colburn text, and it shows how the destroyer rebirths the world as it passes by, the destruction and recreation. In here, it keeps talking about that the earth is the earth, and the heavens are the heavens, and be ready to move on. <clears throat> Excuse me. But this is shown as the winged disc here, the destroyer. Now, in this Colburn text, they talk of Moses, and they talk of the time of the Exodus, right here. And this is the part where I'm trying to show now that this is all part of God's plan of what's coming. And on my channel, I keep showing, let's look at this here. I show this box a lot, the cover of the Illuminati, the devil standing at the top of the world pyramid. And when he comes down, is cast down by Michael, he comes down on the red side because remember the devil has but a short time well Esau rules by the sword <clears throat> and by fear they have but a short time and that's when the great tribulation begins even here with this representing the mark of the beast and all of the new world order is about making everybody worship this calf this is the symbolism of the idol that all of the new world order must worship you must take the mark of the beast and you must be made to worship an idol. Well this destroyer in this book here, the Colburn text, God has set the destroyer to destroy all idols and all idol worshippers. It is written in this book that he sent the dragon to reprimand the world and that after it had destroyed the world the first two times basically it brought the flood it did the other thing these are all by the hand of God but that man in his youth began to worship planet X and the destroyer and started to make idols to it and see how it's like the bull see when its arms are out it is as the red bull coming as I keep showing the red bull judgment coming well they began to worship it all during here and right in this book you can read through here if you want to but God sets this thing like almost like a machine and he sets it he, he sets it to destroy all idols and all idol worshippers from there on so anytime this thing comes by it destroys idols and idol worshippers 
during the Exodus, all of the idols of the Egyptians were cast down and they were destroyed. And then they were destroyed when they went through the Red Sea, when God caused the waves to crash back down on top of them as Moses made it through with his people during the Exodus. We're nearing the time of another Exodus. This one will be when we are pulled up into heaven and the earth is completely redone because this is his plan and even it's it's to have everybody to be damned that did not believe in the Lord Jesus. So everybody that ends up worship, worshiping the idol in the new world order will be destroyed. That's what this is all showing. It's all a lie, a trick, a time of deceit. And even the devil is allowed to do it. When he's cast out, he has a short time and he knows it. He gets everybody on the idol before Nabooru shows up. And then he is locked back up into the abyss. And then the destroyer comes by and does the seven last plagues of God, as in the book of Revelation where we find that one. This thing, the winged planet, the winged disc. So that is why the Illuminati and everything have everything going perfectly by the word of God. See this guy here, the red, the time of Edom and Esau. Esau is known for making a stew. He has made a butcher's stew right here. This is butchered body parts in the water like a stew. The time of Russia and North Korea and he will turn on them too. When the devil leaves and is locked back up, Nabooru comes by and wipes out everything. It just wipes out the whole world and cleans everything back up. And that's, this is actually part of God's plan. Right here at the White House, here in Washington. This is when the nuclear football is ready to go off. This guy comes down, goes into Obama, blows all these nukes. At this point in time, the USA falls, and the great deception begins. This phoenix rises through the flames of when America falls. That's our rapture. You should be ready to go through the fire. We leave at exactly the same time. We pass over Russia, which gets everybody to go to the idol worship. It's chasing the Christians. They worship this idol of a crystal skull. And then they will all be destroyed by the great Nabooru that's coming by. The Washington Monument here is making the eye. Jesus said, can we make it through the eye of the needle to get into heaven? And that his heel would be bruised at that time, and the head of the serpent would be bruised when he kicked down the devil. Here is the heel of Jesus. Here is the nuclear football ready to go off. And it's during the time of this eclipse, and we go right through the goalpost and into the White House. We go into God's mansion. It is all prepared. America has been built for this. The whole world is built for this all to happen. Here he comes down. He goes in. He blows up the whole USA with the harp machine and everything. And we all go right through the fire, and Jesus... See this right here is the dog star opens up a gate for us at exactly that time. See this is the gate. We go right through the star systems. It's all real for our soul. Our fleshly body isn't going to go. So there you go. It's all planned. The whole world is made for this moment and your ticket out of here is to call for the Lord Jesus Christ. They even call this the ellipse and that's when we go through the eye of the needle and into the mansion of God. We go into the White House. May the Lord Jesus Christ have mercy on us all. Confess with your mouth the Lord is Jesus. Believe in your heart God hath risen him from the dead and you'll be saved. Hallelujah. Call out to him. This is real and all around us. Hallelujah. I will put these links in the description box.
years after the flare comes under, lights up the bottom of the object. Here, they've scrubbed it. There's still a faint circle in the time. Now, it, we don't know anything about a size because we don't have anything to compare it to. How close was it to the stereo A camera, right? But we do know that it was taken off. Why? We got a caller that sounded official. Sounded like he knew what he was talking about. Four people lost their job over that image getting leaked to the public. Is there something out there that will make a man's heart fail out of fear, guys? What's going on with this? Don't know. It's a heads up. Be safe. Как будто оттуда, да, что-то вот, э, то ли свет, то ли... beginning, Nibiru was a lush planet, teeming with life and vegetation. Nibiru orbits the sun once every 3,600 years. This is called one shar. Volcanic eruptions on Nibiru envelop the planet with a thick protective atmosphere, keeping the heat trapped on the planet during its long, cold outer orbit and shielding it from the sun's heat during its inner close orbit. Unlike the other planets, its rotation was elongated while the other planets and the hammered bracelet we call the asteroid belt were more circular in their solar orbits. As time went on and the people of Nibiru advanced, great astronomers and scientists emerged, even savants of great wisdom. Each shar or orbit, the conditions on Nibiru grew worse. Drought and crop loss were studied and it was determined that the orbit was growing closer to the sun on the inner courses. Their atmosphere was growing thinner because of declining volcanic emissions. During the sixth kingdom, Inshar was born. He was born wise and studied and mastered much learning. He decided to study the other planets in their atmospheres to try to find a solution to his own planet's thinning shield. As Nibiru appeared, by its circuit, Alulu was greeting to him a welcome extending. Alulu speeded through the solar system and described the beauty of each planet. Finally, beyond the fifth planet, he reached the asteroid belt, the hammered bracelet. Ahead was raining. To, to demolish, it was a waiting. Of rocks and boulders was it together hammered. Like orphans with no mother, they banded together. Many times the Nibirian ships had been destroyed trying to cross through this bracelet. Alulu stirred up the fire stones in his spaceship and increased power. Alulu fired death missiles at the great rocks one by one as he entered the belt. The hole in the asteroid belt opened and Alulu spotted the seventh planet and the sun. He set his machine for the snow-hued Earth. He noticed the Earth was smaller than Nibiru and the gravitational force was weaker. The planet was divided into three parts, the top and bottom white and the middle blue and brown. Deftly, Alulu spread the chariots of resting wings around the Earth's ball to circle. In the middle region, dry lands and watery oceans he could discern. The beam that penetrates downward, he directed. Earth's innards to detect. I have attained it, he ecstatically shouted. Gold, much gold, the beam has indicated. It was beneath the dark-hued region and the waters it was too. With pounding heart, Lula, a decision was contemplating. Shall he on the dry land his chariot bring down, perchance to crash and die? Shall he to the waters his course direct, to perchance it into oblivion sink? Which way shall he survive? Will it be the treasured gold discovered? In the eagle's seat, Lulu is not stirring. 
to fate's hands the chariot he entrusted. Fully caught in earth's attracting net, the chariot was moving faster. Its spread wings became a glow. Earth's atmosphere like an oven it was. Then the chariot shook, emitting a mortifying thunder. With abruptness, the chariot crashed, with a suddenness altogether stopping. Senseless from the shaking, stunned by the crash, Alula was without moving. Then he opened his eyes and knew he was among the living. At the planet of gold, he victoriously arrived. His chariot on dry land ascended. At the edge of extended marshes, it landed. He put on an eagle. It was a white-hued ball in the heavens, and it was quickly rising. Kingu, the earth's companion, he now beheld. What in the accounts of the beginning his eyes the truth could now see. The planets in their circuits, the heavens, the celestial emissary, greeted him. Little Gaga, the one who shows the way. By its circuit, Alulu was greeting to him a welcome extending. Alulu speeded through the solar system and described the beauty of each planet. Finally, beyond the fifth planet, he reached the asteroid belt, the hammered bracelet. Ahead was raining, to, to demolish it was a waiting. Of rocks and boulders was it together hammered, like orphans with no mother they banded together. Many times the Nibirian ships had been destroyed trying to cross through this bracelet. Alulu stirred up the fire stones in his spaceship and increased power. Alulu fired death missiles at the great rocks one by one as he entered the belt. The hole in the asteroid belt opened and Alulu spotted the seventh planet and the sun. He set his machine for the snow-hued Earth. He noticed the Earth was smaller than Nibiru and the gravitational force was weaker. The planet was divided into three parts. The top and bottom white and the middle blue and brown. Deftly, Alulu spread the chariot's arresting wings around the Earth's ball to circle. In the middle region, dry lands and watery oceans he could discern. The beam that penetrates downward he directed. Earth's innards to detect. I have attained it, he ecstatically shouted. Gold, much gold, the beam has indicated. It was beneath the dark-hued region and the waters it was too. With pounding heart, Alula, a decision was contemplating. Shall he on the dry land his chariot bring down, perchance to crash and die? Shall he to the waters his course direct, to perchance it into oblivion sink? Which way shall he survive? Will it be the treasured goal discovered? In the eagle seat, Alula was not stirring. To fate's hands the chariot he entrusted. Fully caught in Earth's attracting net, the chariot was moving faster. Its spread wings became a glow. Earth's atmosphere like an oven it was. Then the chariot shook, emitting a mortifying thunder. With abruptness, the chariot crashed, with a suddenness altogether stopping. Senseless from the shaking, stunned by the crash, Alula was without moving. Then he opened his eyes and knew he was among the living at the planet of gold he victoriously arrived. His chariot on dry land ascended at the edge of extended marshes it landed. He put on an eagle. It was a white-hued ball in the heavens and it was quickly rising. Kingu, the earth's companion, he now beheld. What this boat was that Nemo, Enlil and Inky's sister, she was the science expert. She was a doctor. When she knew this was coming against Enlil's wishes, he wanted the human race annihilated. He didn't want them to grow any further. The earth was going to be covered. He'd rather start over. Well, she and her nurses went across the earth in the months leading up to this and gathered the DNA of all the animals, of all the races. They gave them to Zara Sudra to go in this boat with the people. Now I'm going to read from there. It says, Eager to see Zara Sudra depart, the townspeople to the boat brought food and water. Now they didn't know what was going on. He had been told to lie. He had been told he was going to build this boat, sail across the ocean because the gods were angry with him. 
So if he left, peace would come back and prosperity to this area of the country there. And so they all helped him. They wanted the things were going bad. They wanted it to get better. So they helped him build a boat. They helped him put provisions in it. Some of them even went with him. Now, it says, from their own mouth, sustenance they took to appease Enlil. They were in a hurry. Four-legged animals into the boat were also driven. Birds from the field by themselves just flew in. And to the boat, Zarasadra, his spouse and sons, embarked. Their wives and children also came. Any who to the abode of the Lord Inkai wished to go, let them to aboard come. In other words, he didn't shut the doors. Just a lot of them didn't want to leave. They thought, well, if it's going to get better, let's just hang here. It said, so to Zarasadra, to the gathered the people announced envisioning Enlil's abundance only some of the craftsmen the call heeded they didn't want to go on the sixth day Ninengal lord of the great waters to the boat came he was going to be the navigator a son of Inkai he was to be the boat's navigator he was selected a box of cedar wood in his hands he held listen guys by his side in the boat he kept it the life essences and life eggs of living creatures it contains by the Lord Inkai and Ninma collected. Remember, Inkai cared for the humans, and his sister Ninma did too. It was their brother Enlil that wanted them destroyed. From the wrath of Enlil to be hidden, to life resurrect if earth be willing. So did Ninengal to Zarasudra explain, thus were all be beasts brought by their twos into the boat. Now, Ninengal and Zarasudra in the boat, the arrival of the seventh day awaited. In, 100 and the, in the 120th shore was...
but these writings are not imagined this happened now what they knew that Nibiru was approaching earth and we'll be able to lead up to the story before I start reading now in the Bible Noah was told to take two of all creatures now in that in the town here we've got not Noah but Zarasudra was his name and he was an Anunnaki he was from he was a son of Enki he was a great navigator called master of the waters they chose him for this boat now the reason the flood was coming was on one of the orbits that Nibiru comes into our inner solar system it was too close for thousands of years its own planet had been declining because of this and other things well when they they were radioed from Nibiru that it was approaching fast so what they did was they set up observation points and observatories on the South Pole because that's where it was coming from. Does that sound familiar? Every nation on Earth now has an observatory on the South Pole, guys. Why are they doing that? But they set that up there to watch. They also set up people to watch for earthquakes. They sent people to the North Pole to give alarms when this time come. But there were two brothers involved, Enlil and Inca. Now, Enlil did not want Inkai to teach the humanoids that had been raised and their DNA changed to be slaves. They, they did not want them to know anything except that they were gods, and that way they would bow down and be slaves. Now, Inkai had a kinder heart. Both were Anunnaki princes, but he had, he had saw the human race evolve, He'd grown fond. His children had married into the human race. But when this time came, they had a, only a certain amount of spacecraft available. All of the Anunnaki could not leave. And the older ones, Enlil, Enke, their sister, they Nimra, none of them could leave. They had been on Earth too long. With the 3,600-year cycle of one year around the sun with Nibiru, they aged far too quickly if they went back. And they noticed also that while they were on Earth, that their years had sped up. One account was a spacecraft came. They were coming back and forth transporting gold. They had mined Africa. That N.K. and some of his group noticed that people that were older than them when they had left Nibiru appeared younger now. That's because they were aging faster on Earth. But anyway, they knew they only had a certain amount of ships to get back to Nibiru. Other ones couldn't even go back, so they had to launch into shifts. The Earth's companion he now beheld. What in the accounts of the beginning his eyes the truth could now see. The planets in their circuits, the hammered bracelet he had all seen. Kai the Earth, King Guich Moon, all created were, all by names were called. In his heart, Alula knew one more truth of beholding was needed. The goal, the means of salvation to be found was needed. If the truth from the beginning tales were true, it's by the waters of the golden veins of Tiamat were washed. If the waters of Kai, it's cut off half, gold must be found. With hands unsteady, Alula the tester from the chariot's pole dismantled. With trembling hands, the fish suit he donned the fast arriving daylight eagerly awaiting at daybreak the chariot he exited to the marshes he quickly stepped in the deeper waters he waded the tester into the waters he inserted its illuminated face he eagerly watched in his chest his heart was pounding the water's contents was the tester indicating by symbols and numbers its findings disclosing then Alulu's heartbeat stopped there's gold in the waters, the tester was telling. Unsteady on his legs, Alulu stepped forward deeper into the marshes. He made his way. Again in the tester into the waters he inserted. Again the tester gold announced. A cry, a cry of triumph from Alulu's throat emanated. The Biru's fate in his hands now was. Back to the chariot he made his way. The fish's suit off he took, the commander's seat he occupied. The tablet of destinies that knows all circuits he enlivened to Nibiru circuits to find the direction. The speaker of words he stirred up, 
toward Nibiru the words to carry. Then the Nibiru words he uttered, thus he was saying, The words of the great Alulu to Anu on Nibiru are directed. On another world I am, the gold of salvation I have found. The fate of Nibiru is in my hands. To my conditions you must give heed. Greatly was disappointed. He turned away from the marshes in the directions of the hills he went. He made his way through vegetation, bushes, to trees gave way. The place was like an orchard. The trees with fruit were laden. By their sweet smell enticed, Lulu picked a fruit in his mouth. He put it. Sweet with the smell, sweeter the taste was. Alulu greatly was delighted. Away from the sun's rays, Alulu was walking toward the hills. He set his direction. Among the trees, a witness under his feet, he sensed. Is locked back up into the abyss. And then the destroyer comes by and does the seven last plagues of God, as in the book of Revelation. Where we find that one? This thing, the winged planet, the winged disc. So that is why the Illuminati and everything have everything going perfectly by the Word of God. See this guy here, the red, the time of Edom and Esau? Esau is known for making a stew. He has made a butcher's stew right here. This is butchered body parts in the water like a stew. The time of Russia and North Korea. And he will turn on them too. When the devil leaves and is locked back up, Nibiru comes by and wipes out everything. It just wipes out the whole world and cleans everything back up. And that's, this is actually part of God's plan. Right here at the White House, here in Washington. This is when the nuclear football is ready to go off. This guy comes down, goes into Obama, blows all these nukes. At this point in time, the USA falls, and the Great Deception begins. This phoenix rises through the flames of when America falls. That's our rapture. You should be ready to go through the fire. We leave at exactly the same time. We pass over Russia, which gets everybody to go to the idol worship. It's chasing the Christians. They worship this idol of a crystal skull, and then they will all be destroyed by the great... Nibiru that's coming by. The Washington Monument here is making the eye. Jesus said, can we make it through the eye of the needle to get into heaven? And that his heel would be bruised at that time, and the head of the serpent would be bruised when he kicked down the devil. Here is the heel of Jesus. Here is the nuclear football ready to go off, and it's during the time of this eclipse, and we go right through the goalpost, and into the White House. We go into God's mansion. It is all prepared. America has been built for this. The whole world is built for this all to happen. Here he comes down. He goes in. He blows up the whole USA with the harp machine and everything. And we all go right through the fire and Jesus, see this right here is the dog star opens up a gate for us at exactly that time. See, this is the gate. We go right through the star systems. It's all real for our soul. Our fleshly body isn't going to go. So there you go. It's all planned. The whole world is made for this moment. And your ticket out of here. stepped. In the deeper waters he waited, the tester into the waters he inserted. Its illuminated face he eagerly watched. In his chest his heart was pounding. The water's contents was the tester indicating by symbols and numbers its findings disclosing. Then Alulu's heartbeat stopped. There's gold in the waters, the tester was telling. Unsteady on his legs, Alulu stepped forward deeper into the marshes he made his way. Again in the tester into the waters he inserted. Again the tester gold announced. A cry, a cry of triumph from Alulu's throat emanated. Nibiru's fate in his hands now was. Back to the chariot he made his way. The fish's suit off he took. The commander's seat he occupied. The tablet of destinies that knows all circuits he enlivened. To Nibiru's circuits to find the direction. 
the speaker of words he stirred up, toward Nibiru the words to carry. Then the Nibiru words he uttered, thus he was saying, The words of the great Alulu to Anu on Nibiru are directed. On another world I am, the gold of salvation I have found. The fate of Nibiru is in my hands. To my conditions you must give heed. Greatly was disappointed. He turned away from the marshes in the directions of the hills he went. He made his way through vegetation, bushes, to trees gave way. The place was like an orchard. The trees with fruit were laden. By their sweet smell enticed, Lulu picked a fruit in his mouth. He put it. Sweet with the smell, sweeter the taste was. Lulu greatly was delighted. Away from the sun's rays, Lulu was walking toward the hills. He set his direction. Among the trees, a witness under his feet, he sensed a sign of close by waters. In the direction of the witness, he set his course. In the midst of the forest, there was a pond, a pool of silent waters. And to the pond, the sampler he lowered. For drinking, the water was good. The Lulu laughed, and unstopping laughter seized him. The air was good. The water for drinking was fit. There was fruit. There were fishes. With eagerness, Alulu bent down. Together his hands he cupped. Water to his mouth he brought. A coolness did the water have. A, a taste from Nibiru's water. It was different. Once more he drank. Then with fright, he asunder jumped. A hissing sound he could hear. A slithering body by the poolside was moving. He carried weapon he seized. A blast of its ray toward the hissing he directed. The moving stopped. The hissing was ended. To examine the danger, Alula stepped forward. The slithered... We have pole shifts and violent geological earthquakes and changes and the like, shifting the, of the tipping of the earth and shifting of the crust. Uh, volcanoes explode. Um, and when they do, there's a lot of l molten lava pouring out. Well, lava, will, being molten, will line up with the current magnetic field. And when lava hardens, that's a permanent freeze, indicating the direction of magnetism at that moment in time. Well, this is one way that they have determined uh, the wandering pole theory, where they've identified places in Earth where they say, uh, at, at one time this appears to have been the North Pole, or that appeared to have been the South Pole, is through this frozen lava um, alignment. For instance, off of Japan, there's cities and roads that they find under the water. In Bermuda, we see roads and walls and the like. Uh, likewise, land can rise. Uh, Atlantis is rumored to be a continent that went under the waves during one of these cataclysmic uh, passages. Back around 1650 BC, or if you want to be, give it a little more leeway, between 1500 and 1700 BC, there is considerable evidence for a calamitous event. In fact, there are stories from that time. Uh, showing certain civilizations came and went, certain uh, powers that be were uh, overthrown at the time because of the celestial events that were happening and the earth changes that were happening. The last passage was during the Jewish Exodus, approximately 3,600 years ago. Nobody knows for sure the exact date because during these passages, uh, mankind is just discombobulated. They stop keeping records. Records are lost, so nobody can exactly pinpoint the date. There is a pattern to the cataclysms on Earth. If we go back every 3,600 year period, we see that some major world catastrophe happens. There are other changes happening in the solar system. One such theory says that cow flatulence, believe it or not, is responsible for depleting our ozone layer, which leads to our polar caps melting. But what about Mars? What about Mars's polar caps? They seem to be melting as well. There are many changes happening in the solar system. So what would be influencing our entire solar system as a whole, not just Earth? Observations are being made and with little notice to the public. This article from CNN tells of a potential killer comet detected with only weeks of warning. In recent times, new planets and outer solar bodies are being discovered and observed. With so much sky to observe, it's no wonder we have so many last minute reports of potential near misses. Or could there be more that is being downplayed in the media or withheld altogether? 
There are a lot of probes that we send to Mars or to the outer planet and with little notice to the public. This article from CNN tells of a potential killer comet detected with only weeks of warning. In recent times, new planets and outer solar bodies are being discovered and observed. With so much sky to observe, it's no wonder we have so many last-minute reports of potential near misses. Or could there be more that is being downplayed in the media or withheld altogether? There are a lot of probes that we send to Mars or to the outer planets to do imaging, um, which could also have black ops projects attached to them that the public isn't going to know about. So if we send an orbiter to Mars to uh, you know, do a main mapping mission, it might have other black ops projects attached to that satellite collecting its own data that we're just not going to know about. And if they need to take into a full account uh, the main mapping mission or you know, take over that project for their own purposes, that satellite is gone. It becomes a black project. And people aren't, people aren't aware of those facts. The observatories around the world Many of them are very aware, acutely aware, and very worried about this inbound planet. Uh, you really need to look at what's happening, the weather irregularities, the changes in the Earth, and think of it in terms of these periodic passages uh, and make up your own mind. We don't have to have a collision for something to affect us. It can affect us at a distance. It could be on the other side of the sun, have a very large discharge into the sun. The sun could erupt with a full coronal discharge, which means it would come off in all directions from the sun. And we would be very affected. Our weather would be very affected in this new object, planet X or whatever you would call it, would be very far away from Earth. So the thing I want to stress is that you do not need a direct collision with something to be affected. The government agencies, uh, they are basically under contract not to tell you anything. They, the scientists have signed non-disclosure agreements, basically uh, they're under a gag order. It is impossible to go to a scientist and get a news release directly. You have to go through an official news release agency and... Okay, guys, you're not going to believe this footage I got here. Check this out. This is Comet Elenine, right here. You see that? Okay, now the sun is on this side. This is where the sun is. There's an explosion that takes place. Jupiter is over here. This is Comet Elenine. Now watch this. I'm going to play it again. It's coming from right here. You see it, you see it skipping across. And as it gets hit by this pulse, it turns to the left and breaks apart. Look at this. Here we go again. It, it's coming along here. Skipping along. This is Elanine. As that pulse hits it, you can see the pulse coming out. It looks like a huge explosion comes off of Jupiter. This could be validating that video that I put out or that I replayed from my show the other day where they said that it would be like a capacitor. As this comet gets close to any other bodies, it shoots out a capa like a, a, an electro kind of an electrostatic kind of thing. It blows up the, uh, the comet. They said that this possibly could happen again, as it did in 2000 with that other comet, that as it crossed the e ecliptic, it hit like a brick wall and blew up. Well, here we go. We got some footage of this. This, comes, this explosion comes out of Jupiter. The sun is on the other side. Here we go. Look it. I'm going to show it to you again. It, it's almost like this pulse just comes out and just whacks it with this massive explosion. This is Comet Elenine right here. You see how it turns? Watch this. It's right here. It's coming along. And as soon as this thing hits it, it turns and ex it just disintegrates. Look at this. See it right there? Boom. Here we go again. 
see how it just turns and just explodes it's coming along boom so you're just seeing it really quick now boom boom just fast motion it boom see how it just turns and just explodes but look at this pulse here it, this looks like a massive ejection or some kind of a a pulse that just hits it and it breaks it apart now I'm sure we're gonna have more footage uh, tomorrow but this is breaking footage right here guys make this viral pass this about I guess we don't have to worry about comet Elodine it looks like it has been taken off of its course at least I'm sure it's gonna be breaking up but what the heck is this explosion here this is Jupiter see you can see the little Jupiter GAU uh, this is Jupiter and this took place today We believe, though we cannot yet prove, that our multiverse universe. December 8, 2012. We've been going over the Nibiru Chronicles. I want to go to a section in the middle. I think it's important now. It's about the Great Flood and their records of it. And just to give you a little background about this, for thousands of years, the Anunnaki had ruled the earth. The Romans or Greeks, all of their gods came from there. All of the gods across the Mayan civilization, all of that came from these astronauts. And I believe before I am through with this series, I can point out enough evidence worldwide to show you. And you can go in and find copies of these Sumerian texts. I'll put a link to one of them. You read them for yourself. These are old, old tablets, the oldest known to man. They haven't been touched. They've been dated. They explain too many things to have been imagined. You can't imagine laser weapons. You can't imagine spaceships. Unless you're in our time and day, you've seen movies. You've read books. All of that, all of the movies you've seen, all of the big Star Trek 2012 came from these writings. The book Doom came from these writings. But these writings are not imagined. This happened. Now, what they knew that Nibiru was approaching Earth. We'll be able to lead up to the story before I start reading. Now, in the Bible, Noah was told to take two of all creatures. Now, in, that, in the town here, we've got not Noah, but Zarasudra was his name, and he was an Anunnaki. He was from, he was the son of Enki. He was a great navigator called Master of the Waters. They chose him for this boat. Now, the reason the flood was coming was on one of the orbits that Nibiru comes into our inner solar system. It was too close. For thousands of years, its own planet had been declining because of this and other things. Well, when they, they were radioed from Nibiru that it was approaching fast. <clears throat> so what they did was they set up observation points and observatories on the South Pole because that's where it was coming from. Does that sound familiar? Every nation on Earth now has an observatory on the South Pole, guys. Why are they doing that? But they set that up there to watch. They also set up people to watch for earthquakes. They sent people to the North Pole to give alarms when this time come. But there were two brothers involved, Enlil and Inkai. Now, Enlil did not want Inkai to teach the humanoids that had been raised and their DNA changed to be slaves, they, they did not want them to know anything except that they were gods, and that way they would bow down and be slaves. 